Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to begin um, by uh, talking briefly about something that happened last week. Uh, I am uh, the son of immigrants. Uh, I've been a citizen all my life in the United States. Uh, last week, I had uh, a proud week as a citizen, as our president, President Obama, granted America's highest civilian award to President Shimon Peres. It was an extraordinary thing in uh, providing the award. The president emphasized that the security of the state of Israel is not negotiable and that the bonds between the U.S. and Israel are unbreakable. He also, uh, that is a, <laughs> he also um, uh, praised Shimon Peres uh, by quoting from Shimon Peres uh, in a way that I found moving, uh, and that's a segue to the questions that, that Yossi asked. Uh, he praised Shimon Peres for, uh, in the darkest hours, uh, always keeping hope, and this is uh, Shimon Peres's words, that the Middle East will not be killing fields, but fields of growth and creativity. And uh, I'm not entirely sure why Yossi invited me today, but I think it has something to do with the fact that this area that we're all involved in, communications, technology, and services, and the internet, and mobile, has enormous promise to drive growth and creativity uh, all over the world. Uh, and I'm going to uh, start by... Um, uh, offering some reflections on uh, an element of the Arab Spring. I do this not as a foreign policy uh, expert or geopolitical uh, analyst, but from the perspective of a uh, communications technology person. Uh, obviously, it's well known that uh, social media played uh, a profound role in what we saw, uh, for example, in Egypt. Uh, during the Arab Spring, of course, one of the things that happened was that the authorities sought to shut down the internet service and mobile service. Mobile service being very important because that was actually uh, the dominant way that people were communicating with each other. Now, when that happened, a lot of people uh, asked and all over the world, uh, uh, how, did they, how did they shut down these services? What does that mean? Uh, these are all very important questions. I'm not going to discuss them, and it's not the subject of the panel today. But here's a question that fewer people asked, but that's very important. And the question is, how did it happen that Egypt had a mobile service and an internet that was worth shutting down? Because in 2000, not that long ago, Mobile penetration in Egypt was under 5%, and internet penetration was barely measurable. As it happened, uh, by 2004, uh, mobile penetration in Egypt was up to 40%. By 2007, it was up to 70%. By 2011, it was over 90%. The internet during this period went from zero to about 30%. Well, one of the reasons it happened uh, is because in the few years before 2000, around the world, people agreed in a set of principles to govern communications technology that unleashed the rollout of mobile and other communications infrastructure around the world. And these were principles that included private markets, open markets, competition, the importance of investment, including foreign investment, and a rule of law. And so you saw in countries like Egypt, all of a sudden, several mobile competitors investing in infrastructure and taking the country from the 0% to over 90% with its connections to the Arab Spring. Uh, one illustration of the ways in which communications policy and principles in this area can make a very material difference in the world. Now, you may think from this example, oh, Egypt is at 90%. Um, 
the internet is on track, that we're at the end of the story. I don't think we're at the end of the story at all in terms of communications technology and its transformative impact on everything. Uh, the internet, social media, cloud computing, mobile, which is really a, a, a supercharger of all the others, uh, we're much closer to the early innings than the end game. And here are a couple of ways to think about that. The 90 plus percent penetration number that I gave you for Egypt, um, if you measure mobile broadband, 3G or better, the number is back down to under 30 percent. And in fact, if you look at the statistics globally, there are 6.1 billion, with a B, mobile subscribers around the world, 950 million 3G mobile broadband subscribers. Well, here's what's going to happen in the next few years. That number is going to go way up. Some people think it'll go up to 5 billion mobile broadband subscribers around the world in the next five years. Uh, I would not be surprised. This is going to have profound changes in countries uh, all around the world uh, in every category that you can think of, but let me just mention a few. Uh, healthcare and medicine. The ability of mobile broadband to provide better services at lower cost to people all over the world is just amazing. Uh, uh, John Chambers and Cisco are working on unbelievable devices to roll out mobile uh, healthcare centers uh, uh, to people who previously had no access to healthcare. Uh, one could do a whole session on this, but the opportunities are amazing. The same thing is true for uh, communications technology and education. Uh, bringing the world's information, bringing expert teachers, tutors to students wherever they are. Thinking about the kind of personalized learning that you can have when you bring together uh, the hardware of the internet and computers uh, and this incredible new software that entrepreneurs in Israel and other places are working on uh, to help students learn and sometimes even more important, help teachers teach with these new technologies. Digital textbooks is an initiative that we're pursuing energetically in the United States. Uh, I believe it uh, can and should become a, a global initiative uh, because instead of having out of date uh, heavy backpacks with old textbooks, it's certainly common in the U.S., I wouldn't be surprised if it's common here, you can have one electronic device that has up-to-date materials and interactive materials that help students and, again, help teachers teach. Uh, energy, I could give you examples, I won't take the time now. Public safety, uh, here's one small thing, you know, in the U.S., I think this is true all over the world, our emergency response system is called 911. You dial 911 if you want an ambulance to respond. Uh, even in the US still today, you cannot send a text to 911. If you take a photo with your smartphone of uh, a crime, you can't send that photo to 911. This is an opportunity. We're just at the beginning of solving this and in other ways providing advanced communications technologies to our first responders. Uh, the positive impact on job creation in the U.S. Uh, and in many places around the world, even in times of economic struggle, the broadband economy is flourishing. The networks, applications and services providers, I'll speak about the U.S., which I know the best, investment up, innovation up, job creation up. And let me talk for a minute about uh, job creation and the internet because there are some myths that are worth addressing head on as we enter a discussion about this. There's a myth that the internet destroys jobs. That it's a disruptor, it's a very nice thing, but at the end of the day it eliminates jobs. And it does eliminate some jobs. But on a net basis, like productivity in general, it creates jobs. And in fact, this has been studied. Uh, McKinsey, the global consulting group, literally studied this and put a number on it. The internet has been creating 2.6 jobs for every job it eliminates. Feels about right to me when I see what's going on in the US. Some other myths. Uh, the internet only creates jobs for engineers. 
Well, it creates great jobs for engineers, and we need to educate more engineers uh, all over the world. But it's not just engineers. In today's world, the internet is creating jobs for construction workers, for sales people, uh, helping small businesses expand. There's a myth that the internet uh, only creates jobs in certain areas. In the US, people might point to Silicon Valley. Well, it creates uh, wonderful jobs in Silicon Valley, and we're so proud of Silicon Valley in the United States and other, our other tech centers. But the fact is the internet is creating jobs now in the US all over the country. Uh, I'll give you one example. There are companies called uh, Groupon and Living Social. Some of you may know about them. They uh, offer uh, discounts to people, uh, including on mobile devices, to help uh, businesses, especially small businesses, attract customers. These are two companies, um, relatively small in the scheme of things, except that those two countries have created over 10,000 jobs in the last four years alone since they were created, over 10,000. More, more than half of those jobs are in, in the United States. Many of the jobs are engineering jobs, but most of the jobs are not. Many jobs are street-level sales jobs, people going into small businesses and saying, hey, we have a product for you that will help you, small business, expand your sales, lower your costs, and small businesses are very excited about it. And in fact, I think we're seeing uh, in the US a revolution around small businesses and the internet. A few years ago, a typical small business owner would have said, the internet, what relevance does it have to me? That's not the case anymore. Uh, more and more small businesses are coming to us and saying, hey, we need broadband in our area uh, because we now see how we, we can use it to uh, expand our profits and hire more people. So I'm uh, bullish on the opportunity of information and communications technology to create uh, jobs, to advance prosperity all over the world along with social media. And I'll conclude with this. I want to come back to what Shimon Peres said, as President Obama quoted him uh, last week, uh, the hope that we see the Middle East uh, not uh, as killing fields, but as fields of growth and creativity. I think what's underneath that is a belief that uh, prosperity is a key ingredient to peace. And one of the things that motivates me every day in my job in trying to unleash innovation and communications technology for prosperity is that I'm absolutely convinced that it will play a positive role in peace in the Middle East and around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Julius.